let me guess. You're tired of seeing those seemingly impossible reading questions show up on the SAT with super long paragraphs and tons of scientific jargon. Well, today I'm going to be going over the absolute hardest past SAT reading questions I've ever seen with in-depth solutions from a 1600 score. Alright guys, so starting off with question number one of the video, you can immediately see there's a really long passage and so this is probably going to be a difficult question. And so whenever you see a difficult question, immediately look at what the question is actually asking you. So which choice best states the main purpose of the text? So I really, when I'm reading, want to try and find the main purpose for the text, right? So that means that when I'm looking at this passage, I'm trying to figure out why did the author actually write this, right? What is the purpose of it? And before we read the passage, let's look at some context in this blurb that they've given us above. So the following text is adapted from Herman Melville's 1857 novel, The Confidence Man. Humphrey Davy was a prominent British chemist and inventor, right? So this text is basically from a book and we get some information on this person named Humphrey Davy. Years ago, a grave American savant being in London observed at an evening party there a certain coxcomical fellow. Uh, now, the sentence isn't even over, but it's a very long sentence, so let's go back and kind of understand what's going on. And you'll see there's a lot of really, really big vocab, right? So there's grave, there's savant, there's coxcomical. This, guys, is why you need to be doing your SAT vocab practice, because even on the reading questions, it's going to help you out a bunch, right? So grave really just means serious, right? So many years ago, a very serious American savant, savant means somebody who's very talented and very knowledgeable in a specific field or just overall very knowledgeable right so years ago a very serious and knowledgeable american in london observed at an evening party that there was a very coxcomical fellow coxcomical just means somebody that's very conceited and very arrogant right so somebody who's very very focused on their outside appearance cares so much about how they look to other people what other people think about them um but inside they don't actually have much intelligence or really substance right so we have this very intelligent or very you know accomplished american who's in london at a party and he's observed this fellow who he thinks is coxcomical as he thought right with an absurd ribbon in his lapel and full of smart banter whisking about to the admiration of as many as we're disposed to admire so he's found this fellow who he thinks is just you know a, a bum right he doesn't really think much of him but he sees that a lot of people are admiring him right now great was the savant's disdain disdain is really just hate or contempt so he's he's not very happy about the fact that this fellow is getting so much attention and admiration right he doesn't understand it because he thinks he's coxcomical but chancing ere long ere long just means not long so basically he want wanting to soon find himself in a corner with the jackanapes jackanapes kind of means the same thing as coxcomical jackanapes just means uh somebody who's very conceited arrogant right pretty similar to what i already described about him uh, he got into conversation with him when he was somewhat ill prepared for the good sense of the jackanapes but was altogether thrown aback upon subsequently being informed that he was no less a personage than sir humphrey davy sir humphrey davy of course is the person that we talked about up here a prominent british chemist inventor so we have this american who's very intelligent and whatever kind of genius and he thinks he sees this coxcomical fellow right who he thinks is a bit of a jokester he doesn't think much of him and he doesn't really like him or understand why everybody else is admiring him uh, and then he's surprised to realize that this person is actually sir humphrey davy so what is the main purpose of the text right now there's answer choice a it portrays the thoughts of a character who is embarrassed about his own behavior this is actually why 90 percent of people got this question incorrect right it's because people thought that this was the correct answer because yes it, it is talking about the thoughts of a character but when do we say that he's embarrassed right now you're, you're thinking logically if you were in the, his position, right, you thought that somebody was some kind of a clown, you were thinking very bad of him, and then you realize that he's actually a very famous British chemist and inventor who's probably, you know, even more accomplished than you, would you be embarrassed? Yeah, I would. But the text itself does not say anything about the person being embarrassed. And that's why we can't assume that. And the text doesn't say that. So answer choice A is wrong. And so this is the mistake that the SAT wants you to make is that they want you to try and infer. So you could infer or assume that the character is embarrassed because you might be embarrassed. But on the SAT, you don't want to assume, you don't want to infer, you just want to work logically directly off of what the text is giving you. So answer choice A is wrong. 
Answer choice B, it presents an account of a misunderstanding. So this is a shorter answer, but is that not what's happening? I think it is, right? He's He has a misunderstanding. He thinks that somebody is kind of a clown, but he's actually kind of a pretty accomplished person. And so that's why B is the correct answer. But let's look at why C and D are wrong. So C, it explains why one character dislikes another. So does this character dislike the other? Well, throughout the you know first half, yes, he does. It does seem like he doesn't like him. But is that the main purpose of the text? Not really, right? What about this second half when we're saying that he realizes he's Sir Humphrey Davy, right? That's not the purpose of the text. And it's also not necessarily true that he doesn't like him, right? By the end of it, after learning that he's Sir Humphrey Davy, he may not even, he may not dislike him anymore. He might like him, right? And answer choice D, it offers a short history of how a person came to be famous. Obviously, that's incorrect. It's not telling us anything about a history of somebody becoming famous. So that's why B is the correct answer for question number one. It's it's just because you need to not assume. You need to purely go off of what the text is giving you. And so that's why the answer is B. All right, guys, now let's take a look at our second question for the video. And this is another big passage. It's asking us which choice best states the main idea of the text. So when we read this passage, we want to try to figure out its main idea. So 18th century economist Adam Smith is famed for his metaphor of the invisible hand, which he putatively used to illustrate a robust model of how individuals produce aggregate benefits by pursuing their own economic interests. So we have this economist Adam Smith, and he's famous for his metaphor of the invisible hand. Right Now, I, you don't really need to know what that is for this reading, and so I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, which he putatively, putatively just means supposedly, or it's assumed that he did something. Right, So it's assumed. We, we aren't 100% sure, but we all assume that he used it for this reason. So he supposedly used to illustrate a robust model of how individuals produce aggregate or collective, aggregate just means collective, benefits by pursuing their own economic interests. So this idea of the invisible hand just says that if all individuals just focus purely on themselves, right, they purely focus on trying to make the most money for themselves, then collectively or aggregately, everybody's interests are actually going to work together to help the economy as a whole. That's what this this theory says, right? Note, putatively, as Gavin Kennedy has shown, Smith deploys this metaphor only once in his economic writings to make a narrow point about the then dominant economic theory of mercantilism. And it was largely ignored until some 20th century economists eager to secure an intellectual pedigree. Pedigree is just in history, right? So if you look at uh, biology with genetics, pedigree is kind of used in that. So this is just a kind of history or, or fact or support for their views, um, elevated it to a fully fledged paradigm. So the second sentence is saying that in reality, Adam Smith himself uh, did not actually care about this metaphor that much. But economists who wanted to uh, who were eager to secure their own intellectual pedigree or kind of history for their views, elevated it to a fully-fledged paradigm or framework. Now let's look at the answer choices. Answer choice A. Some 20th century economists gave Smith's metaphor of the invisible hand a significance it does not have in Smith's work. Okay, well that first half is correct. Right, they gave it significance, but it doesn't have that in Smith's work. But it is nevertheless a useful model of how individuals produce aggregate benefits by pursuing their own economic interests. That second part, could that be correct? Could you assume or maybe infer that that's correct? Absolutely. But once again, on the SAT, we don't want to infer. We only go by what the text is giving us. And nowhere in this text does it say that the model is a good or useful model. And so A is wrong. Now, as choice B, Smith's metaphor of the invisible hand has been interpreted as a model of how individuals acting in their own interest produce aggregate benefits. Yes, that, that is how it's been interpreted. But it was intended as a subtle critique of the economic theory of mercantilism. Was it? I don't think anywhere in this text they say that it was a critique, right? It was a narrow point about the then dominant economic theory of mercantilism. So yes, this theory made a narrow point about it, but we don't know if it was a critique. It doesn't say that anywhere in the text. Answer choice C. The reputation of Smith's metaphor of the invisible hand is not due to the importance of the metaphor in Smith's work. That's correct. But rather to the promotion of the metaphor by some later economists for their own ends. That's that's also correct. That's why C is actually the correct answer. Because what they're saying is that, yes, this the reputation of this metaphor is not because of how important the metaphor actually was in his work. Because it wasn't that important. 
But why does it have such a big reputation? Because some later economists promoted this for their own ends, which is exactly what we say here. Some economists who were eager to secure an intellectual pedigree for their own views or their own ends elevated it to a fully fledged paradigm. They made it famous, even though it isn't actually doesn't actually deserve to be famous necessarily. Now as towards D, although Smith is famed for his metaphor of the invisible hand, the metaphor was largely ignored until economists in the 20th century. So, so far, this is correct. It was ignored until people in the 20th century started to talk about it, came to realize that the metaphor was a robust model. That's incorrect. When in the text do we talk about people realizing it's a robust model? They didn't realize it was a robust model. They realized that it was a model which gives them an intellectual pedigree for their views. Right? So D is incorrect. Nowhere does it say it's a robust model. That's why C is the correct answer choice, mainly because most people who got this wrong chose A, and A is incorrect because you cannot infer on the SAT. All right, guys, now let's take a look at the last question of the day. So which choice most logically completes the text? Okay, so this is basically just a really big scientific passage, and then we want to figure out which choice, which one of these answer choices can fit in at the end of this text and complete it logically. So Chelsea Wood et al. Et al. or et al. basically just means end researchers. So in this case, Chelsea Wood and her researchers tracked temperature-driven changes in the abundance of Anisicus sp or CLP that requires... So Anisicus sp, I'm going to call this AS. The reason I'm calling this AS is because on the SAT, they try to give you these big names, these big scientific names to try to mess you up. It's better to just think of them as AS, right? Just think of them as kind of some kind of uh, initials, right? So, uh, Chelsea Wood and her researchers tracked some temperature driven changes in the abundance of AS, which is a complex life cycle parasite or CLP that requires three host species throughout its life cycle. GS, I'm just going to call this GS, a directly transmitted parasite which requires only one host species, and 83 other parasite taxa found on eight fish species. So, so far, what information have you been given? Well, we want to make sure on these big scientific passages, we write it down because it's a lot to hold on to. So, AS, right, Anisicus sp, is a complex life cycle parasite, or a CLP. So, we'll say it's a CLP, and it also requires three host species. So, it's a three host species, right? It requires three hosts, right? And then we have GS, right? The thing with GS is that it's a directly transmitted parasite, so it's not a complex parasite, it's a directly transmitted parasite. And it only requires one host species. And then they also did that research on 83 other parasites, right? And they found they did research on parasites that were found on eight different fish species. Now CLPs, which is really complex life cycle parasites, so these AS3 host species, are transmitted when an infected host is ingested by an individual of another species. So try to visualize what's happening, right? Let's say that we have this parasite on a small fish, like a salmon, for example, right? And then a big animal, you know, a big fish, like a bass or like a shark, comes and eats that salmon, right? What's going to happen? It's going to, the shark or whatever ate that salmon is now going to ingest that parasite, and that's how it's transmitted. Right, and so in that process, it typically shields CLPs from the external environment. Right, so when you're directly eaten by another animal, uh, you don't have to deal with the external environment. You directly go from the stomach of one fish to the stomach of another fish. Right. Whereas directly transmitted parasites like GS are exposed to external conditions during transmission. Right, so they are exposed to the outside water when they're transmitting from one host to another. However, Wood and her researchers found that three host CLP abundance decreased as sea temperatures rose. So what they're saying is that as, as temperatures went up, right, as temperatures went up, this AS or the CLPs went down. They died off. There were less of them. But the one host species were largely stable, right? Suggesting that, so the direct species, or the one host species, we'll say, uh, were stable. They stayed roughly the same. They didn't go down, right? So what does this suggest? Well, so the answer choices. Answer choice A, any advantages that the transmission strategy used by three host parasites may have conferred did not completely offset the negative effects of other temperature-driven factors on parasite abundance. This is actually correct. 
Now, what this is saying is any advantages that these th CLPs have that their transmission strategy gives them. So are, do they have advantages? Yes, they do, right? What is their advantage? That they're shielded from the external environment. That's their advantage. But that, that advantage did not completely offset the negative effects of other temperature-driven factors, which makes sense because if they didn't offset the negative effects, then what would happen? They would experience negative effects, and some of the negative effects include death, which is why some of these parasites are dying. So that makes sense, right? That's why A is the correct answer. Let's look at why the other ones are wrong. So B, CLPs primarily transmitted by ingestion were less dependent on host species adversely affected by warming temperatures than were CLPs that use other transmission strategies. Well, we already know that it already says all CLPs are transmitted when an infected host is ingested. So there is no other transmission strategy. There's only one, and that's ingestion, right? So that's wrong. The other thing is, why are we comparing CLPs to other CLPs? We need to be comparing CLPs to di direct parasites, directly transmitted parasites, right? Now, answer choice C. As the number of host species involved in a parasite's transmission increases, the parasite is better protected against rising temperature. Well, is this true? As the number of host species goes up, so let's say we have one host here, right? When we have one host, are they how how are they protected against rising temperatures? Well, when we have one host and temperatures rise, nothing changes. So they're protected, right? Their population doesn't go down. But then when we go up, right, the amount of species goes up, is the parasite better protected? No, because the parasite's population goes down. And so the opposite of C is correct, right? As we increase the amount of hosts, the parasite is actually worse protected against rising temperatures. And then, answer choice D. Directly transmitted parasites identified in the study were more likely to use transmission strategies that shield them from warming temperatures than were three host CLPs, right? So, directly transmitted parasites were more likely to use transmission strategies that shield them? Well, how is that true? Because we already know that three host CLPs are shielding them cells from the external environment and direct parasites are not. So how can we go against what we've already stated in the text? That's why answer choice D is wrong. And so that's why answer choice A is going to be our correct answer. And it's pretty simple when we just focus on what the text is actually telling us.